Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, the podcast brought to you by the magazine that in January uh, 1970 put on its cover, my favorite. One, a, uh, a, a drawing of a half protester with a Molotov cocktail and a half cop with a truncheon under the uh, winning headline, uh, Campus Riots, the Pigs and the Other Pigs. I am Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Peter Suderman, and Catherine Mangu Ward. Happy Throwback Monday, everyone. Howdy. Hey, Matt. Happy Monday. So uh, try as one might to spend our entire adult lives not giving a rat's behind about what happens on college campuses. You just cannot consume the news nowadays. I've tried and it doesn't work uh, without being smacked in the face with protest madness at universities, tent cities springing up everywhere, students issuing demands uh, for universities to boycott and divest from Israel, classes disrupted, graduation ceremonies canceled, administrators and politicians either sending in cops to clean out the tents or not, uh, sporadic bits of violence, charges and counter charges of racism and anti-Semitism, and of course, politicians saying crazy, crazy things, uh, and everyone bringing up that historical boogeyman of a year, 1968, particularly since the Democrats in their infinite uh, non-wisdom have chosen Chicago to be a great place to have their uh, nominating convention this year. Catherine, I see from my uh, CNN uh, website live update page, now that's all just about campus protests, that, uh, quote, Yale University students set up tents, risk possible suspension, and potential arrest, school says. So uh, what is a uh, libertarian to make of all of this tumult, Catherine? And is it time for all of us to embrace our inner, inner Lanny Friedlander? It's hard to say. Absolutely. We will be approaching this issue from the pigs or other pigs lens. And uh, Lanny Friedlander and his infinite wisdom was correct. Um so I think the the kind of first question uh, of a libertarian should be, all right, this is this is first and foremost a free speech issue, right? Uh, and that over and over and over throughout history, college campuses have managed to not thread that needle correctly. Like they just, for some reason, cannot figure out how to make a clear series of guidelines and then stick to them. And this is largely because it depends on the relationship of the protesters to the national political context and also just the political biases of the college administrators themselves. So in this case, uh, and really in every case, I turn to Greg Lukianoff, who has offered some excellent clarifying remarks uh, in the context of his work at FIRE. And... Um, you know, I think free speech protects people who are saying truly horrible things, including truly horrible things about uh, about Jews and truly horrible things about Israel. Um, it does not protect threats of violence. Those are the two easy polls to start with. Uh, I think the question of the tents on campus is a weirdly difficult one. And in this case, most universities already have clear content neutral rules about when you can put up an encampment on campus and what happens if you do so in violation of those rules. If people want to put up their tents and then bear the consequences for having done so, that's civil disobedience. And sometimes we like that and sometimes we don't, depending on the cause. It sounds easy when I say it like that. It sounds easy when Greg says it like that. And it is just truly astonishing how spectacularly universities that are supposed to be the homes of the smartest people in this country are screwing it up every single day. Uh, FIRE, uh, for those scoring at home, uh, is the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. It used to be in education, and so they specialize on that. Greg's piece on Substack is terrific. We'll put it in the show notes, but it just measures up the number of events on campus this year having to do with cancellation of speakers and disruption of events and free people being punished for their free speech as well. And it's very useful background for all of this. Nick, you're a doctor of something or other. Um, and you're also uh, someone who's defended higher education. But uh, first, I should just give you your own bespoke uh, Rutgers headline here. Um, Muslim groups file discrimination complaint against Rutgers. So uh, congratulations for that. Um, put it in the context of un universities here George Packer at the Atlantic had a big piece or a piece piece. Uh, tying what was he all apologizing for this time? <laughs> he's not. He's not this time. He'll apologize for yeah. this piece later. Uh, but he sort of ties this all in to 
kind of the revolutions of 1968 coming home to roost in such a way. And I want you to react to a short uh, little passage that I will read to you from that, if you don't mind. Uh, He says, ideas born in the the 60s, subsequently refined and complicated by critical theory, post-colonial studies, and identity politics are now so pervasive and unquestioned that they've become the instincts of students who are occupying their campuses today. Group identity assigns your place in a hierarchy of oppression between oppressor and oppressed. No room exists for complexity or ambiguity. Universal values such as free speech and individual equality only privilege the powerful. Words are violence. There's nothing to debate, end quote. Uh, Do you uh, kind of agree with the Packer analysis that what we've seen now is the triumph of 1968 illiberalism? Yeah, I actually don't. Um, and I do recommend reading that piece. He quotes D.H. Lawrence towards the end saying, you know, the arguments of uh, one generation become the instincts of the next. And that's, you know, fascinating. I, when I was in graduate school, in particular in the late 80s through the mid 90s, I was taught by a ton of former hippies, many of whom had literally been educated at UC Berkeley when Ronald Reagan shut down the colleges. Uh, And he did that partly because the hippie protesters were saying, shut down the colleges, you know, because there's so much bad stuff is happening here. And then when he did it, you know, they were like, why did he do that? Um, But I will say that the 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 leading edge boomer generation who were on campus in the 60s uh, and into the early 70s, were remarkable for being totally into free speech and robust debate. You could shout, you could chant, you could do all of that stuff. Violence was off the table. But they were true uh, you know, apostles of free and open and unfettered debate. These were also the people who had either gone to or helped pr- produce teach-ins against the Vietnam War in the, uh, in the mid-60s, starting in the mid-60s. Uh, Rutgers had a particularly uh, known one because Eugene Genovese the great uh, U.S. historian of slavery, got fired over his participation in a Vietnam uh, teaching in, I think, 65. Um, So I don't think, I think it's easy to say, you know what, there was a bunch of, uh, you know, violent violent political protests in 1968, and that some of it had to do with X, Y, and Z theorists. Marcuse is the the one who comes up the most. I don't think that explains what's going on on campus here. I also don't think that the oppressor oppressed thing or that the valorization of identity politics in the way we're seeing it. I don't think it's a straight line from 68 uh, with a stopover in postmodern identity in the 70s. I think as much as anything, what you're seeing is that colleges over the past you know, several decades, uh, you know, it is a declining industry. Uh, and what you are seeing is a failure of leadership at the top of, the, uh, of you know, purpose of the business, et cetera. Uh, college, uh, the number of, uh, of undergrads peaked in 2010. It's been declining ever since. It had a slight uptick last year. Most people assume that colleges will be uh, have fewer and fewer people there. And what you see in Sunset Industries are idiot CEOs. And this is you know, college presidents, uh, it is faculty assembly, et cetera. They don't have a sense of purpose anymore. And what happens with that then is that all sorts of different things start to you know start to creep in and claim the uh, the ruins of the empire for their own, and that's what's going on here. But I, you know, as somebody who is you know very into postmodern thinking, who is very opposed to identity politics, the way that it gets talked, it's it's hard for me to see the direct line from Foucault uh, to uh, you know a bunch of rich overprivileged kids, you know, having great tents in the Columbia Yard. Um, it's, it's not because of that. It's something else. And mostly first and foremost, it's that nobody knows what a university is for anymore, starting with the people who actually run it. Uh, and then you get chaos as a result. Peter, I was going to grab, uh, the most protesty headline from your alma mater, but, uh, about the best I could do was, uh, university of North Florida introduces two new cannabis education certificates in partnership with green flower. Second tier state schools for the win. (laughs) So as our uh, resident college normie here, uh, can you appreciate for a minute? (laughs) That's a weird characterization. I mean, I went to several colleges, so I I guess I have more experience than maybe some of the rest of us. I think I went to to three. 
Um, yeah, okay. Not Same. very long. Um, it's possible but, I was enrolled in a fourth. I, I have never been able to track down whether or not I enrolled in the Uni University of Kentucky. I, I know I thought about it. I did, didn't vast, go to any classes. If by the normie, bills don't I, show up, you were you were not enrolled. By normie in this case, I mean uh, we're not talking about Columbia and whatever boating school Catherine went to and whatnot. Um, the <laughs> we're talking about places that don't necessarily get shut down all the time uh, for. Um, uh, protests and other things, but, um, uh, and just in general, I was reflecting uh, today, like how horrible it is for the high school graduating class of 2020. Could you imagine this? Like, uh, let's say, okay, so your graduate high school graduation was canceled. Your freshman year was in a dorm with a mask, uh, taking zoom school. And now that you're graduating, um, all the graduation season is being canceled uh, as well. Um, they, they That's uh, actually they, kind of a gift. C graduation yeah. ceremonies are <laughs> horrible. I yeah. intentionally skipped mine to move to Washington, D.C. so that I could get here a couple of days faster. God, you suck. Anyway, if I were doing this segment, <laughs> if I were hosting this week, the segment would be called Notes on Camp. Yeah. Yeah, oh and that's uh, why you're not hosting. Do you, do you have you're some of those hosting notes? again? <laughs> he sure does. Let's yeah. have him, Peter. Oh uh, yeah. Look, I, I, I just, I love like the the recurring tent aspect of discourse in the last year, right? Like, anytime there's there's a bunch of tents involved and some leftists, it's a bad scene. Like, it's no, nothing has good has ever come also, from a whole lot of leftists and a whole bunch of tents in the same spot. Also, Chuck Schumer is just suddenly there. Yeah. Like, if there's, a, if there's a concentration of tents and cameras and leftists. No, I just totally associate myself with the first uh, paragraph of that Lanny Friedlander article from 1970, which starts with the line, we are trapped in the middle of a street war between two breeds of pigs, the police and the new left. Okay, the pig thing is a little bit exaggerated, <laughs> probably not the language I would use. And then there is just this litany description of like how the scene goes every single time. And it's one long sentence with every like all, all these sort of full sentence clauses divided by semicolons. Yes. And that's that's how you write an opening paragraph, folks. <laughs> and the main thing that I like about that is sure, the sentiment, sure, but it's the semicolons. You, everybody should read that piece. It holds up remarkably well for uh, a piece of, you know, 50 something year old journalism about the conflicts between police and protesters on campus. Uh, Catherine, uh, we are a uh, libertarian magazine. I, I hasten to remind you. Um, and we're constantly talking about the exercise of government power and what politicians are doing and such. So let's talk a little bit about what the uh, various politicians are saying and doing. Um, did this just in, um, Donald Trump, uh, truth social uh, in all caps this morning, uh, uh, stop the protests now with three exclamation points. So that's great. Uh, Tom Cotton and Josh Hawley are talking about let's send to the National Guard. We had 21 House Democrats telling uh, Columbia that you better clear that quad uh, or else you should resign to, to the uh, chancellor. There, Greg Abbott in Texas uh, is uh, specifically uh, named Students for Justice in Palestine in a March 27th executive order uh, requiring Texas colleges to revise their speech policies to combat anti-Semitism. Uh, there's other uh, uh, suggested ideas from various Congress critters to do similar anti-anti-Semitism bills. Uh, are any of these a good idea? What is your analysis of how uh, politicians are acquitting themselves? I think we do have to give it to Greg Abbott, who has perfectly calibrated a response that uh, will be found to be unconstitutional. Like, he really couldn't <laughs> have done it better if he tried. He was like, let me just be super clear. We are not content neutral here. And also the speech that we would like to uh, rule out on public college campuses is definitely constitutionally protected. Um, anti-Semitic speech is gross and disgusting and horrible. Um, and I know I don't have to say that, but also apparently we have to say that. Um, so I'm happy to say it. Gross. Please stop doing this. Please stop saying horrible things about the Jews. That has world historically not ended well and is understandable to me why people are very, very, very sensitive about this. However, it remains constitutionally protected speech, except for in the case that it crosses over into threats. Um, you know, for me, the... Um, 
you know, it's the it's the kind of showboating that is particularly troubling. Like at my understanding, at least, uh, I do not remember 1968. Um, but my understanding is that in 1968, this was like mostly the business of the kids um, and the idea that we have kind of um, authority figures out here, like in the in the encampments saying I'm on your side or I'm on the other side uh, is not helpful. It's fantastically unhelpful. Um, and it's it's going to make all of the subsequent kind of unraveling of who has been punished rightly and wrongly all the more difficult. And so, all those authority figures think they're channeling the spirit of 1968. Right. Like you can't. But what's crazy is so many of them are like my age. They're like in their mid 40s. They weren't around in 1968 either. This is 1968 envy. It was the end of history when we were in college, as I have said on this podcast before. There was nothing mattered. Lol, nothing mattered. And so I guess maybe people feel like they um, are missing out. Um, finally, I would just say the people whose current plan to deal with this is to do another Kent State should think again. Like that yeah. seems to be a thing that many people well, are in part all was okay. sincerity calling for. And I, I, I just don't think it's going to go well. Call me crazy. You got to say that was the greatest uh, kind of admissions publicity that Kent State could have ever cooked up. <laughs> it's the no only reason anybody knows about Kent State. Too soon. Uh, we should probably talk just a little bit about the specific, uh, the, the way that anti-Semitism has, uh, I think, shaped some of the protests and the response to them. Uh, I'm not the first person to come up with an, this analogy, but if you think about, uh, if you think about any other group that was... Uh, setting up a camp in the middle of a college campus and then shouting stuff that was like at least borderline, you know, kind of bigoted towards a, another minority group, towards black Americans, towards women, towards anyone that wasn't Jews, right? There would be no question that the that campus authorities would be out there like, you're gone. Like, this is it. This is not happening. This is not okay. Where there's no equivocation. Like, there, there, it's just, there would be a, a universal condemnation. And the fact that Campus authorities, uh, that administrators uh, are are in some cases, uh, you know, participating, encouraging, at least allow you know, sort of saying, well, you know, this is this is something we have to think about. I think, um, I think is relevant here, and it's it is a it's a different standard for this kind of speech because it is because it is politically favored on campus. Uh, Nick, I was I was uh, next to uh, uh, the great Pete Welch yesterday uh in his uh in his room and he's getting to a, a mental place of magical realism now which is kind of a uh, beautiful to behold he's a, a columbia uh graduate uh school graduate and we were watching cnn and there's pictures of the quad and he's looking at it and he turns to me and says i cannot determine uh what it is that they're trying to accomplish <laughs> <laughs> no, no, i i can tell you they want uh, they want Colombia to divest from yeah. Airbnb. I'm not making right. this up. That's one of their specific demands. It's a uh, boycott, uh, uh, divest, and sanction. I mean, uh, Colombia in particular is one of the hotbeds, of, not only of post-colonial theory that a lot of this stuff is pulling off of, but the BDS movement, which is uh, you know reminiscent of in the uh, in the mid '80s, the the big campus protest was divestment from South Africa. Uh, that uh, endowment should uh, strip out any companies that did business with South Africa. BDS is a is a more extreme version of that. Uh, what do you think of BDS? Um, is that a good idea? Is that a worthy goal? No, I don't. Well, I you know, there's two ways to think about it. One in general is like, should people you know discipline you know or, or enforce their values through market relationships and things like that? And I think that's you know a, a good idea. That makes a lot of sense. When it comes to uh, public universities, that becomes a lot more difficult be or, or public pension funds because all of this stuff has an analog off campus that is ultimately to me much more deeply troubling because it will have a much, much bigger effect on things. Um, but I don't think that the answer to, uh, you know, like if you are mad at Israel is to try and get your college to not uh you know not allow uh israeli uh professors not uh not allow people to go to israeli conferences or not to you know not to allow any of that kind of stuff to put a wall around israel as if it is a uniquely uh you know horrific nation or institution 
again, you can make that decision on your own, but it is, I think, a fundamentally flawed analysis of you know, relative merits and demerits of things. And I think it shows, you know, the triumph of sloganeering over anything, uh, anything approaching actual analysis, uh, you know, on any level that could be considered vaguely intellectual. I also think this is, you know, in um, divestment efforts really hit different when we're talking about colleges that have the kind of endowments that um, these top schools do nowadays. So I think Yale's endowment is like $40 billion. Right. Um, and, and somehow it's like 10 percent of Harvard's or something. I, I'm making that up. But it's like somehow yeah, the, much the smaller than are, Harvard's. The numbers are really, really large, so much so that like it's a sort of a cliche joke or whatever to say. Like these are these are like hedge funds or investment firms that like happen to run a college on the side. And um, by accident. And I think that, you know, com- compared with the way that that conversation went down in the 80s, you know, we are talking about a quite substantial amount of money. And um, that just raise, raises the stakes for everyone in ways that are like counter synergistic to the project of actually educating students. But the demands that they are making are not even for a direct uh, removal of college funds from something you know directly involved in the Israeli government. For example, I, like I said, they are p- calling for um, Columbia to 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 stop their investment in Airbnb, but also in Google. And the reason they want to stop uh, the investment in Google is because Google has a bunch of contracts with the Israeli government. And so it's this two or three steps removed type of demand that it's really hard to imagine that if Columbia followed through on all of this, that it would make a single bit of difference in the actual prospects you know, for the, the the turn of the the war as it is going right now. I'm not saying it wouldn't make any difference in the world at all on anything because it, it is a lot of money. But is this going to stop the war in any way? Is this going to stop anything that you oppose that is happening in Gaza right now? And it's really I, symptomatic both of the students, but also just of the left generally, which has, uh, which just has their their whole mindset is a campus mindset in which everything that matters can be dealt with through by you know by like lobbying campus administrators and that's just not the way the world works it's totally impractical and it's divorced from i think you know it's divorced from real policy and political considerations but also just how normal people live their lives i mean there we i've talked many times on this podcast about how like whole ass sanctions by the U.S. government on Russia don't really seem to have worked very well or Iran or many other nations like well, they did lose the McDonald's and that was a big deal because they had to replace it with fake Russian McDonald's. Yeah. Which apparently is very inexpensive if Tucker Carlson is to be. Uh, you know, you're also starting to see this stuff be, because in an American context, this is all kind of fantasy projection on some level. And, and so you create more and more things. And when the rhetoric that has been capturing a lot of attention lately is, you know, we know that Jews are the oppressor uh, or they're the colonists. And colonists, the slogan goes, have a country they can go home to. So Jews should go home. They should go home to Poland. Um, and, you you know, you wonder, is that just a statement of a staggering amount of ignorance? Because Jews in Poland were wiped out. They were wiped out by the Nazis and they were wiped out by the Soviets. Uh, but there are effectively zero Jews left in Poland. So the people who are saying that, is that like a deep, you know, a, uh, I, I don't know, like a medieval Catholic church anti-Semitic troll of, you know, an unbelievable dimension, or is it just total stupidity? But in either case, it's not something that should be, you know, seen as a serious policy suggestion. And I think, again, it reflects, uh, you know, just a level of, um, you know, stupidity and kind of fantasy world that is deeply disturbing. I'm not sure how exactly how you address that other than through, you know, and this is the the libertarian cop out, right, that Catherine was talking about at the beginning, but it's like more speech and it's more engagement. I have been thinking a lot back to, you know, um, when I was in college as an undergrad in particular, it, it seemed like every week there was a protest about something because there was a lot of stuff to protest about American military uh, policy in, in Central America in the 80s. Uh, there was the South America or South African stuff. There were tons of things. There were a bunch of early environmentalist things. The one thing that I never you know, remember were the threats of violence or following through on that or 
people would protest the speaker outside. Then everybody would go into the lecture hall and listen. Then the, the people who disagreed would ask some angry questions and it would kind of repeat itself. And I think that's a much better model, you know, particularly on a college campus. We're not talking about a union hall and we're not talking about, you know, a street protest. We're talking about a university which is supposed to have something to do with rational analysis, thinking and higher level kind of debate and discourse. Um, and again, this is why I, I just think, you know, universities have so lost their way uh, because they are like, you know, the CEOs of Kmart or Sears you know, from 10 or 20 years ago. They don't know their business anymore. And as a result, everything is going to shit. God, I, I miss those think, blue light specials. I do think Go Back to Poland is a pretty classic Hanlon's razor, if I had to guess. Like, this really seems like don't attribute to malice what can be explained by stupidity, right? There's at least one video going around of, I believe it's a protester at Columbia, it might be a different school, who's like, yeah, you know, we're just here because we're showing solidarity with the people in Gaza, and we just really want the, the administrators to, to, well, I don't really know what we're asking, but we're just trying to, like, <laughs> listen, literally this person just what? cannot name even a single one of their dumb demands. What's, what's, you know, what's wrong with that? Is what I have to say about all of that. I feel like I should stick What's up for the protesters. What's wrong with that is that this has occupied the attention of everyone in the talking about stuff class. It's a, it's like six stories on the front page of the Sounds New York Times like right now. Because it's easier to than dealing with what's actually going on in the Middle East than the American role, right? Because I know it. I mean, I agree with you, Peter. That's like I've seen that. It was a couple people at NYU, I believe, but it's like. You know, there there are the the United States should not be involved militarily. We should be involved diplomatically in helping to create the the conditions for, uh, you know, an end to the violence that's going on. And you know, we're not doing that. And this is also, you know, a lot of people comment on how the American chattering classes is obsessed with higher education, particularly elite higher education, which will charitably say are the 400 out of 4,400 universities and colleges that have any kind of selective admissions. But like we talk about what's happening on these campuses and we take our eye off the, you know, if anybody should be pressured, it's Chuck Schumer, not for showing up at Columbia, but for not figuring out how to not just call for regime change in, in Israel or something like that, or Joe Biden or Donald Trump. Like what is, is there an American role to help create peace? And if so, what is that? Rather than worrying about somebody who is living in a tent, which I can guarantee you is better, is a higher quality living experience than the dorm rooms we were in in college, you know, 15 or 20 or 400 years ago. I want to speak briefly to the uh, possible practical effects of this in kind of answer to what Peter was saying earlier. Um, I think it can have an effect on it if, uh, if not just Columbia, but a lot of universities are out there and this is dominating the news. I'm out in California right now, it dominates the local news. What's happening on UCLA? There was violence over the weekend, USC graduation uh, 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 ceremonies canceled and the speaker canceled because she uh, had some mildly uh, intemperate uh, posts on Instagram or something. Um, and so if it's widespread, if uh, members of the uh, administration are canceling their own uh, uh, commencement speeches, right? It's commencement speech season for politicians. They're like, ah, maybe sit this one out. Um, if Joe Biden is w worried sick about uh, losing Michigan to Donald Trump, which he is, and there is a pretty restive population there. And if his administration and the State Department is staffed by people who graduated recently from Columbia and Georgetown and elsewhere and share a lot of the belief systems of people who are under 30 graduating from elite colleges right now and staging protests out in front of the White House. What I'm saying is that Joe Biden feels this and hears this constantly. Um, he can't, you know, have a hundred thousand dollar fundraiser without some code pink person bumming him out about this. And so in that sense, um, and in the sense that Kamala Harris is super activated about this to the extent that she's activatable at all, um, is uh, that he feels this and feels pressure to make uh, make it stop faster. Um, and that's enough. And that's an impact uh, that you can say is sort of an indirect impact from college students who don't know anything necessarily because they're college students, um, but also following their, I think, um, potentially quite humanistic impulse to say, gosh, this outnumbered population 
largely civilian, is getting pulverized. And that sucks, uh, which I think is a very human, normal thing to do. And we shouldn't necessarily hold the people who even get a tent out um, to uh, express that opinion uh, to some kind of higher standard that we wouldn't, that uh, that we otherwise uh, hold to policymakers. That's my mini speech of the day. Um, all right, let's uh, go to our um, uh, uh, listener email of the week uh, here in a moment. But first, a sponsored message from our pals over at Donors Trust. Friends, are you passionate about preserving civil liberties and individual freedom? Obviously you are. Do you desire to support organizations cough, cough, that uphold these principles, yet find it a struggle to navigate the complex world of charitable giving. Well, here's the perfect solution for you, a giving account with Donors Trust. A giving account, also known as a donor-advised fund, is a simple, secure, and tax-advantaged way for libertarian givener, givers such as yourself, giveners, the scriveners, uh, like you to support the causes that you care about the most. With a donor advised fund, you can make a contribution, receive an immediate tax deduction, and recommend grants to your favorite charities over time. Cough, cough. Best of all, you retain control over how your charitable dollars are invested, ensuring that it aligns with your values and goals. Whether you're passionate about defending free speech, protecting property rights, or promoting limited government, a giving account with Donors Trust empowers you to make meaningful impact. Get started. Go to www.donorstrust.org slash roundtable and begin making even more of a difference in the fight for freedom. That's www.donorstrust.org slash roundtable. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. All right. Reminder, uh, email your short queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one comes from Shane McKenzie, eh? who writes, hello, roundtable. The Tuesday episode of The Daily Show this week. I'm not going to comment on your viewing uh, habits here, Shane McKenzie. Uh, this week featured uh, Stephanie Kelton as the guest. She is a proponent of MMT. That's a modern uh, monetary theory, not some kind of mixed martial arts. Uh, she explained to the co-hosts, Jordan Klepper and Ronnie Chang, that a deficit sounds scary, but is actually just the difference between two numbers. That's all it is. She also comically referred to the deficit debt as a benign math problem. But what is so wrong with MMT? Why shouldn't libertarians support an extreme version of MMT with no more taxes for anyone? And then the government spends the amount of money deemed fit. We'll just have a larger difference between the two numbers. What is the harm? Peter, why don't you lead us off with that? Yeah, so it's a difference of two numbers, and one of them is the amount of money we have, and the other one is the amount of money we spent. And it, the problem is that the amount of money we spent is consistently a lot larger, and that money actually represents something. It's not just like a, a, a yeah, money is a little complicated, numbers are complicated, right? When you get it, like, what even is two, man? Right? Like, no, but like, <laughs> it's it, this is not the way to think about it. It represents real resources. It's not a perfect. Uh, representation of real resources. But in fact, those, but, but money is like a, there's ultimately you can only draw on the resources that actually exist. And when you are borrowing money, you are borrowing from the future, which means you're spending resources that don't, resources or productivity gains or whatever it is that don't actually exist yet. Um, a, a big problem with MMT is that it is not falsifiable. So other macroeconomic theories, including Keynesianism, you have sort of big models that they can use to kind of test their predictions. They're imperfect, but at least they're sort of saying this is this is a model of how we think things should work. Whenever you press the MMT people for a model, for a for a sort of like this is what we predict and this is what we expect, they just kind of shrug their shoulders and like, well, MMT doesn't work like that because that's not how we think of things. You're thinking about everything backwards. And what they have they have spent so much time doing really kind of odd, like occasionally interesting, but odd and I think mostly irrelevant to their own cause uh, academic work on like how exactly does money get created? And there are these like thousand word papers on like, you know what? It's just keystrokes on a, on a keyboard. And that's what they've proved is that it's just it's key, keystrokes on a keyboard and then money is there and you're like, okay, so what? If you want to, if you want to, would like a, a sort of a, a great takedown of MMT, I would recommend Mark Goldwine's Twitter feed from a week or two ago, where he spent just a, an afternoon basically going through leading MMT proponent Stephanie Kelton's Twitter feed and showing that every and all possible outcomes, no matter what happened, oh, well, that just proved that MMT is right. When anything and everything proves 
that you're right, but also you won't make predictions and box yourself in, that means that you don't have a real theory. That means that you're fake. MMT is nonsense. And I think, uh, frankly, the last couple of years have uh, have been uh, the worst for the for MMT because we have not exactly tried MMT like an, ex, as the proponents have suggested it, but we have gone in a, a, an MMT ish direction of just saying, well, you can spend as much as you want, and they say, well, that should be fine, it'll be great, and look, it's not great. There's a lot of inflation. It's been a big problem. We can't afford to just buy anything and everything at all all the time because, in fact, money is kind of sorta uh, real enough. Nick, who are your uh, favorite uh, uh, slash least favorite Republican spiritual godfathers or enablers of MMT? Oh, I mean, then you got to go back to uh, people like Jack Kemp and Art Laffer and whatnot, um, who, you know, the supply side, uh, you know, saints who said, like, don't worry about spending, Uh, you know, just keep cutting taxes and you'll get growth and then everything will take care of itself. Uh, to kind of put a slightly different spin on what Peter was talking about, the real problem with massive, sustained, and unbridled deficit spending, which is what we've witnessed uh, virtually all of our entire lives, is that it reduces economic growth in the long term. Maybe not in this year, maybe not next. You know, next year. I don't want to go into a uh, Casablanca speech, but over time, predictably, everybody, including the Marxist economists at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And, you know, a bunch of hardcore, you know, capitalist economists uh, in, you know, in the greater Boston area, let's say, all show that when you have large, growing, unrestrained deficits, there is a sustained period where economic growth is lower than it would be otherwise. So what you are doing when you spend a lot now that you don't have on stuff that is not like actual improvement, not capital improvement, either in people or in things is you just reduce the rate at which the economy grows, which is the only way we know of to increase living standards. Um, And Reason has done a, we did a bunch of this work back in the day when people were saying, oh, the stimulus spending is good and deficits don't matter. You know, and Dick Cheney, obviously, you know, it kicked off the 21st century version of that when he said, uh, Reagan proved deficits don't matter. In fact, they do and they reduce long-term economic growth, which is a real problem. Catherine, you have to be at least a little bit tempted to say, all right, MMT people, and also governments and politicians, because they don't care at all about deficits anymore. If none of this matters, then you don't need any taxation money. Yeah, I mean, I I appreciate the question askers, kind of uh, what I perceive to be their their nihilism about the whole thing. It's like, (laughs) you know what? We can't fix it. So our taxes might as well be lower. Um, and and I, I am with the, the letter writer on the vibes, but I am with uh, Peter and Nick on the math. And so I think in the end, when it is vibes versus math, we do have to defer to math. That I'm sorry. hard. Sad. Thanks, Barbie. <laughs> All right. Uh, last week, the New York <laughs> Court of Appeals overturned by a vote of four to three. That's close. Uh, disgraced movie mogul Harvey Weinstein's Weinstein's February 2020 conviction of a first degree criminal sexual assault and third degree rape, concluding that the trial court made an impermissible mistake in allowing testimony from witnesses describing conduct that didn't have anything to do with the underlying charges directly. The ruling vacated Weinstein's 23 year jail sentence though he's also serving a 16-year sentence in California for rape and sexual assault. It is unclear right now whether Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg will retry the New York case, given that and Weinstein's uh, health and whether all of the um, people are willing to go to trial again and, and testify against him. Catherine, uh, the headline on Billy uh, Binion's a reason piece was, the court was right to overturn Harvey Weinstein's rape conviction. Uh, so why does reason uh, love rapists? Yeah, Billy's piece is really, really good. And also, uh, uh, the headline's a little clickbaity for sure. Um, and I <laughs> said that as someone who that. approves the headline. That's how um, it cuts through the clutter. Um, because what he says is, listen, procedure matters. Procedure matters even when you are just a world historical douchebag. Uh, and so um, in this way, uh, all topics are the same topic. Like you can be truly, truly, truly awful and still um, have all of the rights of a citizen. And in this case, this is, you know, we're talking about due process. So it's quite true that we shouldn't 
um, a way that we handle allegations of sexual assault and misconduct is not to just make a giant pile of how many people also accused the person like that is that is not good practice. And that is, it, you know, in, a, in an exaggerated way, that is sort of what happened um, in this trial. And, um, you know, I'm perfectly happy to see him rot in jail and subsequently in hell. But I don't. You know, <laughs> you only believe in one of those. I do. That's true. That's Are you really a true. hell abolitionist? Yeah. <laughs> I actually am. I feel very <laughs> called out. Um, but uh, it seems like he's going to do that anyway, first of all. Um, and second, uh, even more important to me than seeing him rot in both jail and hell is uh, is seeing justice done. And I, and I think that it was here. Nick, are you? What's your assessment of how uh, laws have uh, changed or due process has changed in the wake of Me Too? I know New York and specifically like extended the statute of limitations, and there's like a rush to file complaints against basically everybody except us, apparently, um, uh, on uh, on sexual assault cases, and they're none of which are even getting any attention. It's uh, crazy uh, that happened nothing like four or five months ago. Um, but uh, is this a sign that kind of the the Me Too pendulum swing is finished, or is this that more of a vibe shift than a law shift? Um, you know, at the uh, start of the Me Too era, I did a video for a reason about how Me Too is better understood as the final act of uh, kind of feminist revolution that started in the early 70s rather than as the start of something new. And I don't mean to wave away uh, the serious issues about due process and things like that, because there was definitely... Uh, you know, a lot of people were treated poorly, um, you know, by the courts and by public opinion and things like that. But it really is important to understand that what Me Too ultimately was about was kind of recentering what was considered um, acceptable activity, you know, in, in the workplace, uh, in various kinds of public arenas and things like that. And I think it's good to, you know, think about regardless of what happens to Harvey Weinstein, the general cultural work and the positive cultural work of Me Too continue, you know, was was a good thing, and it's been settled. Which is that, you know, when I think about uh, the stories that I would hear, uh, you know, at my father's company uh, in the '80s of what was acceptable behavior in the office place or attitudes towards women or minorities or whatever, like that era is over. It came last to places that were more feudal and aristocratic in their uh, in their mien, like um, Hollywood, uh, like academia, like politics, where the people in charge had a lot of control over uh, things. But it's, for me, that's the, the real takeaway of all of this. It's, it's less about Harvey Weinstein. It's good that he gets the full legal protections that we all deserve and things like that. But the fact is, is things have changed and they've changed you know, fundamentally for the better. Peter, can you uh, issue your answer only in Miramax movie titles, please? When Harvey met, nope, nope, nope. Something about Monsignor. <laughs> uh, no, any reactions for uh, about this uh, particular case? Well, once upon a time in Hollywood. No, that was nope. A, mm -hmm. um, no, this is. I mean. It, Billy's piece is, is correct here. This is not really about Me Too, and this is not you know part of a kind of, wait, did Me Too go too far? This is just about uh, the justice process. Um, and you know, for those people who are, I think, concerned about, is, this, is he going to get justice for what he did? Uh, as you noted, he is still sentenced to 16 years in prison in California for sex crimes. And that is, that is not on the table uh, for being overturned. All right, let's get to uh, as, as much as we can. A lightning round here. Uh, the uh, former uh, and possible future president of these United States, Donald. Let's call J. him the forever president. Uh, Melania is the forever first lady, as far as I'm concerned. That's mm -hmm. a separate question. Uh, Donald J. Trump is on trial in lower Manhattan uh, six months before Election Day on 34. We call it Manhattan below the waistline now, Matt. Just going to let that go go uh right. he's up for 34 felony counts of falsifying business records 
uh, in an effort to allegedly conceal payments made to pornographic actress Stormy Daniels, uh, allegedly in exchange for her not spilling the beans about their relationship in the run-up to the 2016 election. Uh, Trump faces up to four years in prison. If convicted, the trial is going into its third week, beginning on Tuesday. Let's uh, quickly go around and extract one uh, uh, reaction uh, so far to the proceedings uh, up until now. Nick, why don't you lead us off? Uh, I was thinking mostly about the testimony of David Pecker, who's the head of American media that ran the National Enquirer, and he discussed the whole concept of catch and kill of, uh, you know, where you would buy stories and then not run them. He started doing this with Arnold Schwarzenegger, who had copious sexual harassment and worse lawsuits against or char- stories about him when he ran for governor. Uh, but Matt, this is a media story because it reminds us the National Enquirer's reign of error is over. Um, around the same time that the alt weeklies have faded, uh, the National Enquirer was founded in 1952 by a mobbed up uh, guy named Generoso Pope Jr., who went by Gene because you know you don't want to be too Italian in the 50s. And um, this, it's kind of an interesting thing to see, like the death really of that kind of celebrity scandal sheet for lots of different reasons. Um, it's gone just like the alt weekly, and there were kind of parallel post war media institutions. Uh, they'll be missed. Catherine, take away. Uh, can I pivot to the other, 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 other Trump trial real quick, which is that Church on Trump. Thursday, the Supreme Court heard um, argument or oral arguments about um, this question of whether uh, Trump is immune from prosecution uh, on charges of trying to subvert the 2020 election. Uh, he took the, the um, you know, the thing that you put in there. <laughs> What is the word I'm looking for? The virus We've somehow protection become thing. The I was going to make a joke dollar about vaccines, you know, about thing, immune. He got thing. it before he immunity, got, and I just he completely got the jab. lost. He yeah. got the jab. Uh, did the jab he make got him the immune? the legal immunity jab. From prosecution. And um, it does look like this... Um, the justices seem uh, likely to um, want to... To, to say that, in fact, no, that that is too sweeping of a claim, but also that we're probably going to have to go back and pick through which acts were, in fact, uh, official acts and which ones were private acts, which is going to extend the time of that case uh, potentially well into Donald Trump's second term. So that is probably more important than the admittedly kind of fun and entertaining National Enquirer sex and lies thing that's happening. Peter, uh, takeaway so far. I can't keep track of which trial is which. Trump is on on trial and accused of so many different things, all of which are kind of the same thing, which is being Donald Trump. I don't like it either. I'm not sure it's illegal. Yeah, I don't think being Donald Trump should necessarily be illegal. Um, this uh, this trial, um, I think, sucks. It should have been brought. It's bad and unseemly to force a candidate for president, even one who's kind of... Pr- probably obviously a criminal or at least does bad things that break the law um, uh, to falsifying business records for a hush payment to porn. No, like let's, why are we doing this? Um, It like has material effects on the um, campaign for presidency. That's kind of a problem. I don't like that. Um, We should, if we're uh, going to be prosecuting, uh, former presidents for their malfeasance, let it be uh, malfeasance that uh, isn't sort of inventing or stretching law in, in new fanciful ways. Like, broke a law, let's get him. Um, but uh, this just seems uh, wrong to me in ways that um, um, people aren't really confronting because there's just too many Trump trials to keep track of. All right. Um, that's all the. Uh, time for this stuff we have for let's get to our end of uh uh podcast what we've all been consuming in the cultural arena Catherine, why don't you lead us off it is the 50th anniversary of robert nozick's anarchy state and utopia and i spent uh the weekend at a conference at a liberty fund conference uh rereading this entire book and talking about it with a bunch of uh very cool people including um a ton of reason contributors who have uh written about nozick over the years Uh, especially Eric Mack, who reviewed the book when it came out in uh, 1974 uh, because of the way that 
reason publication schedules worked at that time. The review did not come out until November of 1975, but that's how it goes sometimes. Um, and uh, this book is absolutely one of the kind of canonical texts that turns some people into libertarians. Um, and um, more notably is a super readable book of political philosophy. Like this is what I was reminded as I was rereading it is that Nozick just has fantastic turns of phrase, including uh, one point when he says, you know, a certain system probably can't work uh, because it would forbid capitalist acts between consenting adults. Great phrase. Um, he absolutely um, rips up the theory of justice of John Rawls, which has dominated the uh, academic practice of political theory for the 50 years since it was written. And um, also just like incredible, incredible personal fashion style. So like just a <laughs> 70s mm. turtleneck situation that wow. cannot be beat. Um, some real eyebrows uh, that yeah. we should all envy. Um, other folks at this conference included uh, uh, contributing editor Lauren Lamaskey, um, Doug Denial, Doug Rasmussen, just like a ton of folks who are uh, some of whom knew Nozick um, and all of whom have um, – you know, debts to pay to this book. Uh, even though Nozick was not an anarchist, uh, this was the first book I read where in which um, someone took anarchism seriously. Um, and so uh, contra to his intent, he probably did eventually turn me into an anarchist. He, however, is a is a minarchist and um, probably still the person who best articulated the case for the minimal state from a theoretical perspective. Um, if you don't want to read the whole book, you could read Eric Max 1975 review of the book in Reason, which I will link in the show notes. Did you talk about the Sopranos scene in which there's a mob witness who's reading Anarchy State Utopia, like drinking a glass of wine? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it, this book is like oddly a cultural signifier. Nozick is out of fashion these days, um, which is too bad because again, genuinely readable, genuinely interesting. Um, and the Utopia section is is a portrait of a world that um, sounds kind of. Uh, appealing where um, there are lots of little lots of little communities where people make their own choices and live their best lives and um, it's a world I'd like to live in uh, Nick what did you uh, consume uh, I uh, because I'm going to be uh, talking with him at reason weekend the upcoming annual uh, donor event that we have uh, I'm interviewing Todd Rose uh, who's an academic and uh, author of books uh, most recently one called Collective Illusions, Conformity, Complicity, and the Science of Why We Make Bad Decisions. Um, it's a really interesting look at how individuals and then groups tend to, to make bad decisions and then kind of compound them endlessly. Um, and it's worth thinking about because, you know, we've, we, you know, at least through the past 20 years or so, we lurch from the wisdom of crowd to, you know, mob rules uh, and things like that. And we never quite, um, you know, feel comfortable resting at any one point of like, okay, you know, are, are groups smarter than people or are they dumber, et cetera. And Collective Illusions helps to go into how, um, you know, small leader uh, kind of people making decisions can actually create a cascade effect that is very negative, even if it is ultimately unrepresentative of what people are actually thinking. And it comes up with ways of trying to surface how uh, individuals and groups and societies can start to have better means of dissent among themselves so that if, if a consensus must be reached uh, with uh, deference to somebody like Nozick, that the consensus is being reached uh, through a real deliberative fashion rather than a couple of leading people kind of setting the tone for something that becomes a very big decision that's very hard to uh, reverse. Peter Suderman, what did you consume? I watched the tennis movie Challengers with Zendaya. Ooh, it is absolutely steamy. the horny sports movie that Hollywood <laughs> needs right now. So for the last decade or so, Hollywood has been in something of a sex recession, especially uh, when it comes to big screen productions. They're just You used to see uh, nudity, but also sort of scenes of desire and passion of people sort of uh, wanting each other. That used to be a common part of the Hollywood 
Hollywood lexicon, and it has been slowly sort of disappeared from the big screen for a bunch of reasons, some of which are even, I think, pretty good reasons. There's Me Too. There's just a general sense that nudity and sex scenes are sort of unnecessary or in some cases even exploitative. I think that's not always true, but it can be. Um, and then there's been the rise of the superhero movies, and this has been kind of interesting. So you've seen bodies change in Hollywood over the past 10 or 15 years uh, to to conform to the superhero standard. This has been true for women's bodies to some extent, but especially for men's bodies where, where guys have just gotten jacked and ripped and shredded in ways that was much le that were much less common in the 1970s and 1980s where, you know, movie stars might, yeah, they would, they would jog a little here and there. But like, if you looked at, if you look at shirtless movie star guys, like of age 40 in 1985, they, now they look like, ah, oh, they just look like sort of like normal skinny guys. They're like, you know, kind of handsome, but now they're all, uh, now they're all sort of incredibly um, shredded. And so we have been in this weird situation uh, where, as one writer put it, in Hollywood, um, everyone is beautiful and no one is horny. Well, Challengers is a movie in which everyone is beautiful and extremely horny. And it's just it's a movie. It's a movie that I, I like. It's super entertaining um, and incredibly sort of well-written and psychologically astute because it is about the psychology and power of desire and about the ways in which wanting something is in some ways the most vulnerable you can be and how wanting something uh, from someone else and wanting someone in a sort of uh, a sexual or libidinous way um, is in part about wanting them, but it's also about wanting something to reflect back on yourself. And so the movie is a sort of uh, three-way triangular love story about Zendaya, the the ten, the you know the the tennis um, superstar who uh, injures herself early in her career and ends up as a coach and sort of uh, managing um, what ends up being her husband's career. But then she's got her ex-boyfriend who is her husband's rival, and she is the you know sort of the, the fulcrum between the two of them. And it is just a fascinating fascinating portrayal of of deep desire and wanting and what it does to you. And it's also, it's just thrilling. It's like, I can't describe how, like how unexpectedly lively and, um, and, and, and like tense this movie is in the way that it portrays what something that is not, you know, sort of a violent thriller type story, but, but instead just a kind of story about love and power. It also has a score by Trent Reznor and Atticus uh, Ross, who are Nine Inch Nails, and it is by far their best score since The Social Network. It's witty. It's funny. Some of the, the musical cues just made me like almost cackle in the theater because it's like, oh my gosh, this is, this is hilarious. I see what you are doing here. Um, the movie is, it's its incredible. It's one of the best movies I've seen in a very long time. Strongly recommended. It is Challengers. Is the uh, tennis gratuitous to the plot? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the movie, in fact, makes a big point about how, you know what? Sex, romance, like um, uh, getting, getting together with someone, it's kind of like a game of tennis. So it's very integral metaphorically. A lot but of also, it is, uh, it is an opportunity to see people physically compete with each other, but also interact and sort of, um, it, there's a physical interplay to tennis that is that this movie shoots and shows you just sort of the, the intensity of it, but also the kind of the, the romance of it in a way that I, as a non-tennis player, uh, was really taken with. If you had uh, been in charge of this movie, you would have titled it something that was a pun on the word love. Forty Admit love. it. Yeah, it's just no Admit question. it. Just I, I'm glad I wasn't. <laughs> Advantage out. Uh, so speaking of sunken, chested 1970s uh, movie stars, um, uh, I, you're not going to talk about Bobby Gritch again, are you now? And you know, sunken, chested 1970s philosophers. Don't forget. Not I don't Bobby know Gritch, not sunken, chested. Uh, he was okay. a badass. Is still. He'll he'll still take you, Nicholas. Did you meet Leif Garrett over the weekend, man? <laughs> <laughs> Leif. We call him Leif in this household. Um uh, no, I watched uh, one of these uh, straight to the airplane uh, documentaries uh, called Remembering Gene Wilder. Um, uh, Gene Wilder, who uh, just I was realizing and watching this was basically my favorite actor growing up um, by far. Um, I, I had recently rewatched re uh, Charlie the Chocolate Factory or whatever it was called. I always get thank you. Um, and, uh, and with my daughter and it, that performance is just like, 
it's just a top five acting performance and no one's going to talk me off that ledge. It's incredible. Um, but like I had uh, forgotten all of these things that I saw in the theater, like Sherlock Holmes's smarter, smarter brother, which he wrote, directed and starred in and, and the Frisco kid, which had a young uh, Harrison Ford as Gene Wilder is playing like a Jewish guy who's going across the country and making Jewish jokes. It's weird. Um, but uh, so it is like a lot of the documentaries that one talks about, uh, which is that you need to have Wikipedia open next to you to get all the stuff that the family just decided they didn't really want to dwell on, <laughs> which in this case is a lot like the first two marriages. Like we suddenly, uh, Gene Wilder, who, uh, for those who are uh, not my age, uh, he was, you know, he's in The Producers and uh, Young Frankenstein, which he wrote, starred in and Blazing, Blazing Saddles, Saddles. Uh, and, uh, and a bunch of other stuff too. But like those were, that's where he made his career. Um, you don't know, it's the best thing about it is that you get audio from him. He died of uh, several years ago, uh, had dementia, Alzheimer's. Um, but he had written a, a memoir in around 2005 and did an audio book. So you get his marvelous voice uh, narrating some of the scenes. And that's, and that's the, the best thing probably about it, that and the Mel Brooks uh, interviews, which are always going to be great, and Alan Alda too. Um, but uh, yeah, you don't really understand um, uh, the fact that he kind of started pretty – his success started late in life and the success also wasn't really successful. That's the crazy thing. The producers was not a success. Willy Wonka and the chocolate factory, not a success. Um, totally iconic, not uh, a financial success. The first thing that finally made his nut was the, uh, uh, everything you always wanted to know about sex, but didn't want to ask or whatever that movie is. And what was his kink in that, Matt? Yeah. He, um, was his making tennis. sweet love to a sheep. Hmm. Uh, over and over again. But uh, anyway, it's, very, it's just a great reminder. It has all the clips and the family and stuff. Great reminder of what a, a, a crazy, marvelous actor he was. The Richard Pryor buddy movie, Silver Streak, uh, on on down. Uh, very interesting. But uh, yeah, we don't hear about the first two wives, the estranged <laughs> adoptive daughter, and a bunch of other things besides. And also that he was sort of a Lee Strasberg, you know, method actor uh, early on in his career and was on Broadway and um, and uh, didn't really get noticed until later. Um, all that's kind of interesting, and you have to look at it on the side. But it's still, if you want to see them, sweet clips, um, fun, uh, and it's all you know. It's very great to hear uh, his voice uh, talking about that. And just like, man, the seventies produced the weirdest leading men. <laughs> just really weird time for uh, for non Marvel leading men, and I'm totally here for all of them, uh, even Elliot Gould. Uh, all right, that's all of the. Uh, Robert Altman references that we can sustain in one podcast. Uh, no, I'm you. just imagining Elliot Gould as Iron Man. He, that's what he would have been. Yeah. That's exactly. It would have been great, actually. I, I don't know who Alan like Alda the is. The super but big he's... collar. <laughs> um, uh, Somehow let's, made out of red and yellow metal. Let's try to stop this uh, thought balloon before it, <laughs> it uh, inflates. It's too late. Uh, and uh, and say thank you to everyone for listening. Um, if you like what we do uh, on this podcast, you should listen to all of our podcasts at reason.com slash podcast. Huge stable of them now. Uh, if you like what we do as an organization, please consider making a tax-deductible donation over reason.com slash donate. We also have a lot of events, particularly, although not only, in New York City. Uh, Nick Gillespie, uh, as the captain of those events, is there anything that you would like to share with the class? I have two things I want to share. Uh, one is on Wednesday, May 8th, uh, we're doing a live interview uh, podcast taping in Midtown Manhattan with Kat Murty. She is the head of Students for Sensible Drug Policy, co-founder of Feminists for Liberty, uh, worked at Cato Institute for a long time. Uh, she's charting a really exciting and interesting course for the largest student-based uh, drug policy reform organization. Go to reason.com slash events to uh, buy tickets. It's co-sponsored by the Psychedelic Assembly. It's at the beginning of the Horizons uh, Perspectives on Psychedelics Conference. So it's going to be a, a great way to kick off a weekend of serious research and kind of discussion of where should drug policy be going. Uh, that's May 8th. Uh, go to reason.com slash events. And then Matt, the other thing, and I'm sure I'm not alone among our co-panelists today. What is the mystery of the chin band-aid? 
Uh, you didn't have to call attention to it. I thought it was it was uh, it was blending so perfectly into my uh, skin color. But once uh, it's seen, it cannot. Uh, you know, it's curious. Am I right, unseen. fellow panelists, or were you going to ignore it, or you're not um, paying attention to? Going to be honest, I had a gusher. I had a, I, I nicked myself shaving and couldn't get the little triptych thing to make it stop. It's, yeah. it's that simple. Since we pivoted to video. <laughs> uh, that forces uh, some of us to wear pants and to shave, and some of us yeah. just aren't very good at shaving, um, which is why Peter Suter. Well, that's what it. your second next, you know, half century will be about that, about <laughs> precision your own, shaving, you know. Your own personal blood meridian. Mm. Oi, is right. Okay. Goodbye forever. Shut the goddamn bear. <laughs>